Welcome to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. I'm your host, Stephen Campbell, and my co-host once again this week is Mark Stiegler, the author of the Brain Trust series, and for our purposes, the author of today's story, Bits Run Free. And, And today we get to the end of Bits Run Free. And I'm excited to see how all this wraps up. We've talked a little bit about your background. Are you are you retired from the technology business, or are you still are you still working? Well, I'm mostly retired, but I'm not very good at retirement, <laughs> and people keep on calling me out of retirement. So I had, uh, you know, after I officially retired, I had a bunch of twenty uh, something guys in Greece request that I give them some consulting on computer security because computer security was what I used to do at HP Labs. And I'm uh, going off in November to give a keynote speech at a computer security conference. So uh, I'm sort of retired. And you're still and you're still writing and you're still it sounds like you're not very retired at all is what it sounds like. I'm not very good at retirement. (laughs) All right. Let's talk about where we're at in the story and where we're going with the conclusion. Have you been listening along? Do you know where we are? Oh, yes. I know exactly where you are. Okay. So give us a little recap for people who maybe this is the first time they they join us. And if that's the case, if you're doing that, you'll find in the show notes links to episodes one and two. So go back and listen to those first and then come back and listen to the third episode. But Mark, go ahead with the recap. So very briefly, uh, our hero, Charlie Winston, the 12-year-old boy who's doing his homework on the Brain Trust, uh, is, is working on one of his computer security modules. And of course, the way one teaches computer security on the Brain Trust is by having the children learn how to hack mm-hmm. other people's computer security. So this lands Charlie into a great deal of hot water because as one of his homework assignments, he winds up hacking into the backup databases for the great state of California and stealing uh, a a very crucial sensitive folder from the attorney general known as the Golden Folder. Anyway, at that point, uh, an investigator comes to the brain trust kidnaps him, uh, and at the end of the last uh, podcast, Charlie and his kidnapper had been rescued, uh, and now it is time for them to go in for judgment, which on the brain trust is done by mediation, specifically by mediator Joshua, who is one of the uh, characters in the brain trust series generally considered to be one of the funniest guys in the system. And one last thing, Mark, before we get to the story, we were chatting before we started recording today about a parallel that you saw between this story as it relates to the Brain Trust and the movie Rogue One as it relates to the Star Wars collection of movies. Uh, Do you mind explaining that to the listeners? One of the interesting things about Bits Run Free as a short story is that there's a it is tied to the rest of the series in a way similar to the way Rogue One is tied to the Star Wars series hmm. in that at the end of Rogue One uh, Rogue One is an entire movie that explains the background behind one sentence in Star Wars the sentence where they explain that lots of people died to get this data to you. In a similar fashion, Bits Run Free is the background leading up to one scene in book three, which I'm not going to describe. You'll have, you can probably guess what it is when you are done hearing the finale of Bits Run Free. Okay, so we haven't heard it yet. No, you have not heard it yet. Okay, then with that as background, let's turn this over to Catherine McEwen for the conclusion of Let the Bits Run Free. Mediator Joshua Pickett wrinkled his nose as he contemplated the cruelty of his fellow mediators. 
Once again, he was embroiled in a dispute involving the redoubtable Ping. When the mediator for the Vorin House had to take a few days' emergency leave to visit his ailing mother, Dirtside, Joshua had agreed to pick up his responsibilities. Things were pretty quiet in Joshua's current jurisdiction on the Haven, the recently arrived isle ship full of billionaires. The billionaires, Joshua figured, were still settling in and hadn't had time to get into any vicious contract squabbles just yet. So when some idiot from the great blue state of California kidnapped a 12-year-old boy, the mediators had had their own dispute. Whose jurisdiction had the kidnapping occurred in? Joshua figured the Gplex 2 mediator should handle it, since that was where Earl Anderson had stuffed Charlie Winston into a suitcase. But the other mediators had argued the real crime had occurred on the Varen House, when Anderson locked the boy into a shipping container bound for Hawaii, effectively engaging in attempted murder. They voted unanimously that Joshua should handle it, but not because of the murder attempt. No, the mediators cheerfully confessed, they just enjoyed hearing stories about Joshua dealing with the consequences every time Ping got involved in a crime. They wanted more. Joshua looked around the room at the disputants. Ms. Ping, so, ah, good to see you. Ping grinned. Good to see you too, but you know you should just call me Ping. Joshua could not help smiling back. Indeed. He looked at the opposite side of the room, where the perp stood, proud and arrogant. Mr. Anderson, the kidnapper. You are looking surprisingly well, considering that Ping was the arresting peacekeeper. The last criminal she dealt with left the ship in a body bag. Anderson jerked in alarm, but quickly steadied. I'll have you know I'm not the perp here. I am an investigating officer for the state of California. He pointed dramatically. There is the real criminal. Joshua followed the finger across the room to the boy standing next to Ping. The child seemed uncertain whether to cling to Ping or a woman with frizzy red-brown hair and eyeglasses as thick as Coke bottles on the other side of him. Joshua nodded to the boy and asked gently, Charlie Winston, I presume? Charlie gulped. I'm not a criminal. I was just doing my homework. Anderson jabbed his fist in the air. He stole some of the most sensitive files in all the databases of California. Joshua rapped a wooden block on the table. Enough, Mr. Anderson. We'll get to that, I promise you. But not, Joshua thought, until he'd settled this kidnapping charge to his satisfaction. He looked back at Charlie. The woman on Charlie's left spoke. Mediator... I'm Errol Lee Winston, Charlie's mother. A boy even younger than Charlie was on Merrill Lee's other side, and he waved. I'm Bobby, he announced proudly. Charlie curled his lip. My baby brother, the brat. Merrill Lee nudged Charlie. Be nice. Charlie was not convinced. He stole my homework. Joshua rapped his block again. We can come back to that later, Charlie, I promise. He looked around until the room was quiet, then turned to Ping. I've read your report. Please summarize so that Mr. Anderson can highlight any points of disagreement. Ping's grin widened. As you wish. She described the kidnapping in considerable detail. Anderson opened his mouth several times as if to object, but reconsidered each time. Finally, Ping finished. Joshua turned to Anderson. What do you have to add? Any corrections? Anderson, knowing the body of evidence in support of Ping's testimony to be overwhelming, went back on the offensive. I was just doing my duty, Your Honor. Charlie Winston stole some of the most sensitive files in California's government. I had to get them back and destroy them. I still do. Ping frowned. Mediator Joshua, I hate to ask this, but could I go now? My fleet leaves tomorrow, 
and I've still got a lot of stuff to deal with. Ping was leaving the archipelago? Perhaps things would quieten down some. Meanwhile, Joshua could see no reason to hold her in this mediation. By all means, Ping. Thank you for your help. Ping nodded. I'll try to get back later, in case you have any more questions. And she was gone. Joshua turned back to Anderson. I find you guilty of the heinous crime of kidnapping a twelve-year-old boy. If we were dirt side, I'd throw you in jail for the rest of your life. But this is the Brain Trust. We have no jails. I'll remand you to the state of California for trial, but given that you were working for the state at the time of your criminal action, I doubt you'll see the inside of a cell. Meanwhile, here on the Brain Trust, you'll be required to pay compensation to the victim. Anderson's eyes bulged. But he's a criminal! Joshua yielded. Perhaps. We are about to find out. Anderson yelled. And you have no right. I'm a California citizen. Joshua shook his head. Mr. Anderson, when you boarded the Brain Trust, you signed an agreement to acquiesce to the findings of our mediators in the event of a disagreement. I have every right, Mr. Anderson and I shall use those rights. Fear not. A knock on the door interrupted the proceedings. How unseemly. Joshua projected his voice. Yes, come in, and please explain why you are interrupting a mediation. Two women entered. The older woman, stiffer and more formal than the green-haired vixen beside her, spoke. Mediator Joshua, I'm Professor Lenora Thornhill, soon to be mission commander for the Fuxing fleet. This is Professor Kiara Thornhill, soon to be mission commander for the Prometheus fleet. Sorry we're late. Our fleets are leaving soon. We're just frantic with last-minute corrections before the departure. None of this explained why the women were here. Kiara apparently noted the gap in Lenora's explanation and filled in the blanks. I'm Charlie's teacher. I was in charge of the assignment that got him into this pickle, so I thought I should be here. She scowled sideways at the older woman. Not quite sure why my mom decided to come. Joshua digested this for a moment. Lenora Thornhill, the founder of Axel? Lenora tipped her head briefly. One of three founders, actually. Joshua couldn't help acknowledging some admiration. My niece loves learning through your software. He scowled. And I love her learning it, except for these computer security modules that involve hacking. I've been expecting something like this to happen for a while. Teaching children about Nigerian hoaxes, phishing, and addictive apps by having them create hoaxes, attacks, and apps of their own is dangerous. Lenora shrugged. It works better than any other approach we've tried. We're rearing the first generation of children ever who are bulletproof against mental manipulation and hackery. She glared at him. Don't knock it until you've examined the alternatives. Kiara patted the air in a calming motion. Whatever. Are we too late to help? Anderson had apparently held his tongue longer than he could stand. They're criminals too. Punish them, not me. Kiara peered at him. Is he the kidnapper? Merrily answered. He's the one, all right. She hugged Charlie tightly. Anderson objected. I was only doing my duty. I must have those files, every copy. Joshua knocked his block on the table for order once again. He had quite the obstreperous collection of participants in this proceeding. He normally didn't have to demand order this often. He turned to Charlie. Son, did you fish the databases of the government of the state of California? Charlie looked miserably up at his mother. She encouraged him. Just tell the truth, Charlie. Charlie blew out a breath. I didn't think it was a big deal. I fished one of the system's administrators and got access to all the backups. I wanted to prove to my teacher that I'd succeeded, so I copied one interesting-sounding folder. The Golden Folder. 
Anderson shuddered. For a moment, it looked like he was going to have brain hemorrhage right there. Why that folder? Charlie shrugged. It looked cool. He added darkly, and really mean. Kiara stepped forward. Let me emphasize what Charlie just said. The golden folder contains damning evidence of the vilest and most vicious government plot I have ever seen. Anderson gasped, nearly collapsing. The peacekeeper standing behind him to make sure he didn't try anything had to grab him to keep him upright. Joshua watched Anderson's agony with more pleasure than was proper. Anderson finally looked as bedraggled as the typical assailant in a mediation involving Ping. As usual, it was most deserved. Anderson pointed a shaky finger at Kiara. You... you've seen the folder? Kiara put her hands on her hips and gave him a bemused smile. Of course, he had to show it to me to get credit for a successful fish. Anderson's mouth worked, but nothing emerged. Joshua asked Anderson's next question. It was his job as mediator, after all. Ms. Thornhill, may I call you Kiara, so as not to confuse you with your mother? Did you share the file with anyone else? Kiara frowned. I thought about it really hard. This scheme of the California government needs to be published far and wide. She sighed. But that's not my job. I looked at it, deleted it, and told Charlie to delete any copies he had, per our standard procedures. Joshua had a sinking realization. He would have to know what made these files so valuable. How many people here know what's contained in the, uh, golden folder? Only Charlie, Kiara, and Anderson raised their hands. Joshua looked hard at Merrilee. He didn't tell you? Merrilee shook her head. That's between Charlie and his teacher. I thought it was good training for him to learn to keep a secret. Lenora smiled. Well said. Joshua took a deep breath. In order to assess the harm done and assign damages, I must learn what those files contained. Anderson, as expected, screamed in fury and despair. Joshua pointed to the door to his private chambers. Mr. Anderson, Kiara, Charlie, this way, please. They'd barely entered the cozy little room full of bookcases when Anderson objected. You can't be allowed to know what those files contain. Joshua stared at him for a moment. Mr. Anderson, please make just one more ridiculous demand. I shall have a peacekeeper gag you and return you to the brig while the rest of us sort this out. Do you understand? After grinding his teeth, Anderson nodded. Joshua decided a little calming of the waters was appropriate to maintain professional decorum. For your information, as a mediator of the Brain Trust, I am privy to large numbers of secrets of the greatest sensitivity. I am the least of your security woes. Joshua turned to Kiara. Should I have you brief me on this, or should Charlie do it? Charlie made his recommendation. I didn't really understand it. You should probably let Professor Thornhill explain it. Joshua nodded and turned back to Kiara. Kiara took a breath. You're familiar with civil forfeiture, the legal trick, where they can accuse your property of a crime so they don't ever have to accuse you or take you to court. They can just confiscate every possession supposedly tainted by the supposed illegal activity committed by the object. Joshua felt his blood run cold. Born of evil. Civil forfeiture in the United States traces its heritage to the Salem witch trials, when prosecutors could claim the items were possessed by satanic spirits, then judge the supposed demon inhabiting it. The practice was abused so much in the 1990s that states passed laws to limit it, but in 2017, the U.S. Attorney General reinvigorated the law. Presumably, he thought too many innocent people were getting away with it. Kiara nodded. 
The Golden Folder lays out the exact pretexts and strategies for California's civil forfeiture proceedings. But that's not the worst part of it. Anderson shouted. You can't tell him any more. Stop right there. Joshua stared at him until he remembered the consequences of another interruption. Then he gestured to Kiara. Proceed. The golden folder contains a prioritized list of millionaires and billionaires to be financially ruined when the state of California risks running a deficit. Not one of these people is accused of any crime. They are only accused of having enough money to help the government balance its accounts while not having enough political clout to stop them. She licked her lips. There are actually three numbers associated with each name. The assessed value of the target, the political fallout of attacking them, and the adjusted value when fallout is included. The adjusted value drives the prioritized sorting process. Anderson turned an odd shade of red, mottled with a delightful shade of purple. Joshua suspected Crayola needed to see this, so it could add a new color to the more extensive boxes of crayons. Kiara spoke with quiet rage. Those people need to be warned. Joshua closed his eyes. Not our mission, Kiara. For the first time, Anderson relaxed. Joshua waved them all back into the main room. Kiara gently pushed Charlie and Anderson out, then blocked Joshua from departing. Mediator Joshua, I need to warn you about something. Joshua sighed. He could smell complications like rain on a storm front. Yes? Kiara whispered grimly. You can't let anyone ask Charlie to describe what was in those files. What was this? Joshua remained puzzled. Kiara continued. He has an eidetic memory. Joshua's eyes widened. As in photographic? Kiara nodded. No one knows besides me. Joshua found that hard to believe. His mother? Kiara shook her head. Marilee has a formidable memory herself but she hasn't realized how much better Charlie's is. Not even Charlie knows. He just thinks it's normal that everyone remembers every detail of everything they see. Joshua swallowed hard at the implications. So he has a perfect image of that list of people in his head. Kiara nodded. Down to the last comma. Joshua snorted. So we really can't destroy all copies of the data, can we? Not without blowing Charlie's brains out. Joshua pondered this for a moment. Anderson would probably go for that option. Perhaps we'll just keep this little detail between ourselves, shall we? Kiara gave him a wide smile. Just what I was thinking. Joshua led her back into the main room and started once again to speak for the record. Professor Kiara Thornhill, did you share the data from the golden folder with anyone? Kiara shook her head. No, sir. Lenora added, not even with her mother. She glared at her daughter, though she should have. Kiara rolled her eyes. Joshua turned to Charlie. Did you share this with anyone besides Professor Thornhill? Charlie's eyes bulged. No, not exactly. While Joshua waited for Charlie to continue, Anderson wailed. He told me there was a thumb drive. Give me the thumb drive. Joshua raised an eyebrow at Charlie. Charlie scowled at Anderson. I told you, my brother stole it. Kiara and Marilee both gave Charlie sharp looks. Kiara spoke first. The dog ate your homework? Anderson pounded his fist on his thigh. Just what I said. Charlie turned his scowl to Bobby. Tell them you stole it. Marilee turned to her younger son. Bobby? Bobby balled up his fists. I didn't steal it. 
Mary Lee put her hands on her hips. Bobby, you know I know when you're lying. A parent always knows. Lenora nudged Kiara. Like I keep telling you. Kiara scowled at her mother. Mom, you're one of the world's greatest experts in facial microexpressions. No one can lie to you. Kiara seemed like she was about to stop, but couldn't help adding, except me, of course. Lenora frowned. Like when? Kiara gave her mother the most cherubic smile ever bestowed upon a mother by a daughter. Joshua knocked on the table again. Bobby? Bobby huffed and puffed. He was mean to me. Marilee sighed. He's your brother. That's what brothers do. Now that Bobby was in confession mode, he couldn't stop. So I dropped his precious thumb drive in the disposal chute. Joshua tried not to smile. He failed. The dog really did eat his homework. Anderson tore into this new information like a terrier with a T-bone. I need that thumb drive. Joshua closed his eyes and sighed. That may not be possible. We need an expert. He didn't know anyone who worked in the Brain Trust disposal and recycling systems, but he knew someone who could probably answer this question. He dialed his cell phone and reluctantly put it on speaker so everyone could hear. Dasher's voice came through clearly. Mediator Joshua, nice to hear from you. How may I help you? Joshua smiled. Dash, good to hear your voice too. I need some information about the archipelago's garbage disposal systems for a mediation I'm resolving. I might be able to help. I know a little bit about it since the recycling system uses the nuclear reactors for process heat. If I don't know, I can probably find someone to help you. Just as he'd expected. A thumb drive with extremely sensitive data got dropped in the disposal chute. Can we track it down? Silence reigned for a moment, then Dash answered. I hope that was not the only copy of the data, Joshua. A thumb drive wouldn't be valuable enough to be extracted by the garbage sorting bots. Your drive has almost certainly been vaporized. Anderson leaped into the conversation. Almost certainly? Only almost? Dasher's voice turned crisp. Almost certainly is as good as life gets, sir. We aren't even certain the mass of a proton is constant over time. Joshua knew it was time to end this. Good enough. Thank you, Dash. I must go now. He thumbed off the phone and turned to Anderson. I realize you don't understand how things work around here, but let's be clear. If Dash is almost certain, that is more certainty than anyone you've ever known has ever offered. Merrily muttered ruefully, All too true. This left Joshua wondering just exactly how Dash had altered reality around Merrily. It was probably an amusing story, but irrelevant here. Anderson stood there, befuddled and uncertain for the first time. But how can we really know? Lenora answered. You need to study Axel's philosophy modules to answer a question like that, Mr. Anderson. Joshua spoke briskly. Let us proceed to the damages and reparations. Silence reigned. He finally had everyone's attention. First of all, taking, stealing, or accidentally acquiring information on the brain trust is considered a minor offence. The act of using that information, however, is taken very seriously and very serious penalties can be incurred if the information is highly valuable. He paused. Since neither Charlie nor Kiara is guilty of using what they learned, I would normally award a small compensation to the state of California. But the crimes committed against Charlie by the state of California in the person of Earl Anderson are so severe, the fine will simply be deducted from the compensation owed Charlie. He paused. Next, Lenora Thornhill. The truth is that your Axel educational system 
is in large part responsible for the predicaments of both Charlie Winston and Earl Anderson. He growled in frustration. Couldn't you just have them run fishing attacks against their teammates and teachers? I know that's what you do when you're teaching them about Nigerian hoaxes. Kiara answered. We'd love to, Mediator, but all the systems in the Brain Trust use object capability security. Fishing doesn't work. Joshua shook his head. How can that be? Kiara opened her mouth to explain, but her mother nudged her. Lenora whispered too loudly. Let Charlie answer if he can. Kiara's eyes widened, and she gave her mother a thumbs up before turning to the boy. Charlie, I know you were struggling to clarify in your own mind the difference between Brain Trust's object capability security and dirt-side authentication-based security. Are you ready to try again for Mediator Joshua? Charlie screwed up his face and took a deep breath. I'll try, Professor Thornhill. He turned to Joshua. Sir, a phishing attack tries to trick the user into using his credentials, his password in most cases, somewhere other than the place where the credentials are meaningful. So if you have a password for a bank and I trick you into using those credentials on my website, I get your credentials and can use them at your bank. Joshua thought this wasn't entirely relevant to the case, but looking around the room, he knew that if he interrupted Charlie then, Kiara, Lenora, and Merrilee would assault him en masse. Charlie continued, That's how it works with authentication-based security, where the credential is only loosely bound to the person, so you can separate them. But in object capabilities, the credential isn't bound to the person. It's bound to the object you want to access. And it's tightly bound. The credential is, effectively, the object. You can't trick the user into separating the credential from the object because they're the same thing. So a phishing attack is in... He stammered. In... Kiara helped him along. In X... Charlie finished triumphantly. Inexpressible! Lenora clapped. Well done, Charlie! It looked like everyone in the room intended to congratulate Charlie, so Joshua wrapped the table to refocus the conversation. Well done, Charlie. Lenora, for future reference... My mediation chamber is not an extension of your classroom. Lenora straightened like a dragon uncoiling. He expected her to breathe fire. Mediator, the whole universe is an extension of my classroom. Oops. Score one for the professor, zero for the mediator. Time to move on. On another subject, Professor Thornhill. We'll discuss these homework assignments attacking dirt side installations later. Your curriculum simply must be changed so this doesn't happen again. He sighed. I would require Axel Corporation to pay damages to the state of California, but California rapidly refuses to sign a mediation agreement with us, so you're off the hook. Which, being honest with himself, Joshua was just as happy about. It would not have served justice for the people who uncovered an enormous injustice to pay penalties to the perpetrators of that injustice. Joshua turned to Anderson. Mr. Anderson, you have committed a heinous crime and shall pay for it. To the family of Charlie Wilson, you owe the following amount in damages. He named a large sum. Anderson howled. I don't have that kind of money. Joshua smiled. You certainly do, Mr. Anderson. In the Caymans. Anderson goggled. But, but how could you know? He turned stubborn. They won't release my money to you. Joshua chuckled. Oh, they would release it, sure enough. But I think you'll release it yourself after a couple of days in the brig. Sleep on it. 
He gave Anderson a look of stone. Mr. Anderson, I am a mediator of the Brain Trust. I command resources beyond your understanding. Anderson slumped. Merrily Winston threw her hands in the air. Woohoo! We're rich! Kiara nodded appreciatively. Congratulations! You can retire. Merrily looked at her like she was crazy. Are you kidding? If I retired, my family would have to leave the brain trust. Move dirt side. She shuddered. No, I'm going to form my own startup. Merrilee's eyes, already magnified in size by the thick lenses of her glasses, grew to planet-sized proportions. I don't have to compete with those twenty-something girls who've been studying big data analysis since they were Charlie's age anymore. On to the next adventure. Anderson brought them back to his number one question. But our data! What if this kid tells somebody? Time to wrap up. Joshua addressed Anderson. The villainy described in the golden folder needs to be published far and wide. I hope someone does so. I feel some confidence that someone will. History suggests a digitized secret does not endure. But the leak of this information will not come from a 12-year-old brain trust boy. Go worry about more serious threats to your horrific plans. He tapped the table one last time. This mediation is over. Joshua had barely risen from his bench when Ping trotted into the room. The others had already departed save Anderson, who was being held by the peacekeepers until the room was clear. Ping looked around in dismay. Did I miss anything? Joshua sighed. We're done with the mediation. He pursed his lips. But for now, the state of California is getting away with a ghastly crime. Ping's eyes glowed. Tell me. Anderson started to object, but Joshua quelled him with a look. He explained in vague terms. Anderson calmed down when he saw that Joshua was not, in fact, revealing any in-depth information. After listening intently, Ping nodded. So Charlie knows this big evil secret he got fish in California, but he can't reveal it? And it really needs to be revealed? Joshua nodded. That about sums it up. Ping smiled in a way that made the hairs on Joshua's neck stand up. No problem. I just met this woman at a party yesterday who should be able to take care of it. She's a real bitch. But sometimes it takes a bitch. Joshua's hair curled some more. Ping was calling someone else a bitch? Did this other woman spit battery acid? Shoot lasers from her eyes? Anderson lost control of his tongue again. Charlie can't tell anyone. You said it yourself. It's illegal even here for him to disclose the contents of those files. Joshua sighed. I'm afraid I have to concur. Joshua had a further dreadful realization. With his photographic memory, Charlie was a terrible danger to himself. If he said one wrong thing to one wrong person, Joshua might have the job of punishing him. The golden file really needed to be published, just to make him safe. Ping was completely unimpressed by the reminder that Charlie could not reveal his secret. Joshua, honestly, do I seem like someone who would make Charlie break the law? She shook her head. Trust me, I've got this. They led Anderson away as he screamed at Joshua to stop her. Ping dialed her phone. Lindsay, this is Ping. Yeah, that Ping. Is there another one? Anyway, have I got a deal for you. Ping brought Lindsay onto the Aspen Glow deck of the Gplex 2 to meet with Charlie. Unlike the Voron house, the Gplex 2 followed the convention of most of the Brain Trust Isle ships by rendering the walls of every deck with a different theme. Here, the walls were covered with clumps of aspen trees their leaves high above blocking out direct sunlight. 
while letting the white-barked limbs and trunks reflect the subdued light of an artificial sunset to make it appear that the trees glowed, the same illusion presented by the actual aspens below Snowball in Flagstaff, Arizona. Ping made the introductions. Charlie, this is Lindsay Postrel. She runs Cognant News. I think you should tell her how you found the golden folder. Charlie's eyes widened. Cognant news? The last news source of the thinking human mind? Liberation, not regulation? Lindsay gave him a broad smile. That's me. I'm astonished that you've heard of it. Charlie shrugged. Axel uses Cognant's reporting for examples in the critical thinking modules all the time. He smiled shyly. You know, I could just tell you everything that was in the golden folder, or write it all down from memory. Ping winced. Best not to, Charlie. Not even for a trustworthy person like Lindsay here, or me. Charlie nodded. Okay. With that, Ping departed, and Lindsay got down on her knees to look Charlie in the eye. So, could you tell me how you got into the state's databases? Just the technical aspects of this kind of hacking. You know, I'm thinking about writing a piece about it, for Cognant. Sure, though I don't know why you need to get it from me. I mean, people have been putting videos on YouTube showing how to fish two-factor authentication systems like California's since, I don't know, 2011 or so? According to Professor Thornhill, you can never really secure a system by patching if it's broken at the core. Lindsay interrupted, not quite impatiently. I understand, but I want your perspective. She tapped her tablet, prepared to take notes. Please, just tell me how you did it, and spare no detail. Priscilla slumped in her chair in front of her computer. What a tiresome place to work. She had submitted her resume to several of the companies on the Brain Trust. Her chances of getting in were slim, but she had to try. She wanted so badly to go somewhere that encouraged the solving of computer security problems in the architecture, rather than putting out fires as fast as she could run through the flames. It was late, and today's fires were all out, as nearly as she could tell. But could she go home? Oh no, the Attorney General had just zapped her with an email. Some security problem he didn't understand was keeping him from getting his work done. Follow this link, he said. Priscilla took a sip of her chamomile tea. She realized that its soothing flavor would not help. She needed a rush of caffeine to make it through this next problem, not serenity. Damn, she was tired. Lindsay found Charlie in a playground on the aspen glow deck, where they had several short but real aspen trees. She waved to him. Charlie! Charlie said something to his friends, then trotted over. Hi, Miss Pastoral. Good to see you, Charlie. I have something for you. She swiped across her tablet, transferring Axel Merit reward tokens to his machine. Charlie's eyes widened. That's a lot of tokens, Miss Postrel. He smiled brightly. I can buy all the hardware I need for my next experiment. Lindsay's eyes twinkled. Hardware? I thought you were going to be a software hacker. Charlie shrugged. It's fun, but I'm done with those modules. Unless you need something. Do you? He looked hopeful. Lindsay chuckled and put an arm around his shoulders. Charlie, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Author's Notes The opening scene is a precise description of how a phishing attack would succeed against circa 2018 flavor of the day security strategies applauded by some experts as the final solution to phishing. There really is an object capability security paradigm that renders phishing inexpressible. Civil forfeiture is real and getting stronger every day with the advocacy of the Federal Attorney General. 
and in a larger context, this short story takes place concurrently with the events around first launch in the Brain Trust series book two, Crescendo of Fire.